This is all that's left of the border town of Safwan. The obstinate Iraqi resistance was crushed under a barrage of artillery. Everyone thought that uh, this would be a very quick campaign, but there's no such thing as a clean war. People die, it's a realism. It's rumoured that the KLA is planning a major offensive during the coming days. They hope to push the Serbs back from the border towards Jakovo, thus giving the Albanian population some protection. The road between Freetown and Mashaka is scarred with the reminders of battles of recent days. Two Serbs who decided to test the conviction of German soldiers were cut down. A hail of bullets heralding the arrival of NATO's new hardline shoot-to-kill policy. As the KLA offensive continues, it appears they not only have support from the air in the shape of NATO, but also the Albanian army. One boy lost part of his nose in a grenade attack. Another was shot in the NATO face. NATO has been very active in the area over the last the few days. The warplanes appear to be supporting the freedom fighters. As the bombs have fallen in the valley leading up to yesterday, the Iraqis launched helicopter a few gunships, over the sending wave after wave of fire in position around the town. We arrived at the border not knowing what to expect and there were tens of thousands of people just filing down the road, walking, sobbing. There was one little boy who had been shoved across the border, he was about eight or nine, uh, running up and down the road just shouting, Mama, 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 and he didn't know where his mother was. We gave him some water, but we couldn't do anything else. And then the next wagon that, that came up had a four-year-old boy who had a perfect hole in his earlobe and the Serbs had just stopped him for a laugh. They'd thrown a grenade at the family and injured his arm. They picked the boy up and just shot him through the ear just for a laugh. They always ask you if you want to do the conflict zones. Being a war correspondent is a bit of a grand title. It is what you, you're called and you get accredited as a war correspondent if you cover a war zone. So they will say to you, some people don't want to do it, uh, quite rightly, understandably. And they say to you, do you want to cover conflict zones? And of course I always said yes. And the first one was in 1998 when the, the Kosovo crisis started. And I went across to Kosovo and I was there for about, on and off for about six months. You know, it was always my ambition to be a war correspondent. That's like the, the, that icing on the cake for a, for a reporter. Uh, but if you don't want to do it, don't do it. And there's nothing you can do to prepare because you don't know what's going to happen. So there's nothing you can do to prepare for what you might see. You know, you might see bodies, you might see kids killed, you might uh, get shot, you, you know, might lose a colleague, all these kind of things. You can't prepare for that, uh, but you have to have the right mentality to want to do it. The way people dealt with it then was they would go out and get drunk with their mates who were there at the time because they were the only ones who could understand it. So there was no suggestion of getting counselling or anything like that. It would be the norm to get counselling these days. But in those days, you went out with your friends, you got drunk, you got, you talked about it, your wives and families, weren't, we, we wouldn't talk about it to them because they simply couldn't understand it. There's no way they can imagine what it's like to have bullets whistling past your head, the special noise that it makes. You know, the, the, the whoosh of the, the air as it comes that close. They would never be able to understand that, but a fellow correspondent or camera person would. It did come back to haunt me about 10 years after the war, because um, what, what happens is uh, 
you deal with your feelings at the time and you and psychologists will tell you you compartmentalize all these feelings and all these memories so you you get over it you might have a weep you get over it you, you it's like a, having a cabinet a built-in cabinet system in your head and all these memories get filed away and they're dealt with and they're treated uh, but sometimes something can happen there's another trauma or in my case I took a, an anti-smoking drug so what it did was tip that cabinet upside down all the files fell out again and I couldn't put the memories back in place and deal with them so I did suffer from uh, PTSD and had did did have treatment for it I think my my feeling is you'd be much more likely to have a, a much worse or have a, a, a much greater effect say you're living in a town that's you're on a tube people are running running past you uh you know if, you, if you're in argyle and walking through the, the hills you might see anyone all day had a massive change of lifestyle uh, sold up in London, moved to the Highlands of Scotland, bought a small estate in Scotland, uh, changed the lifestyle completely. Um, we ran a, a, a quite successful little holiday business, uh, which was which has been great for the last 15 years. The kids were, they looked like my, I have two daughters, they looked exactly the same, you know, blonde hair, blue eyes, uh, but they were coming across the border in Kosovo on the backs of, of trucks and the backs of tractors and, and bogies and uh, even lawnmowers, you know, anything they could do to, to, to get transport to escape. And it, it was what happened to the kids that, you know, were the most depressing thing. The next wagon that came across uh, had a little boy uh, called Drenny Checker. I'll never forget his name. He's now living in Canada. I managed to trace him. Uh, but he had uh, a bullet hole in his elbow, and we had interviewed him and said, what happened? And he said, well, I was in a house with my mum, uh, my little sister, uh, and about 14 aunts and uncles in the basement. And the uh, police, these were police officers, came in, uh, and they opened fire. And... Uh, one by one, all all of us got killed. This is the never After after they uh, finished shooting on the people and be sure that they all are dead, start putting fire on the house. This is the uh, as as the uh, Serbian forces get to the front door, preparing to put fire in the house, by considering all the people had been dead, and uh, the young boy trying in their own uh, face not to get uh, picked that he's still alive. He got hit in the elbow and, and fell down, and two of his aunties fell on top of him, and that kind of saved his life. He got up, took a chair, threw it through the back window, jumped out the back window, and he was halfway out, he said, I could still, I, my, my, my little baby sister in my mother's arms was calling out my name. My mother was dead, but he could hear her, this little girl calling out, going, Drenny, Drenny, Drenny. And he couldn't do anything. He had to just, the flames were too high. He ran down the back path. And that was his, the last thing he, he heard was his name being called out by his sisters.
it does happen sometimes like last night you don't sleep very well come out here there's no better therapy in the world than just casting the line out into the river it doesn't have to be a lovely warm day you feel on think about nothing else just about fishing it resets your your mind and it's just so relaxing until you catch a salmon then it's not so relaxing but that's the fun of it Good. Nice and clean. I can vividly remember coming back from Kosovo and, and the day I got back, my wife and family were on holiday in, uh, in Scotland because uh, I came back early. I managed to, to get back, went fishing. Um, uh, I arrived at about two in the morning, couldn't sleep, got up, took a fishing rod, walked out to the local loft, caught my first ever salmon, my first cast. And it was the first, and while playing that fish for 20 minutes, it was the first time that I had not thought about Kosovo for about six months. Just it was. It, I can still feel it draining. All the stress draining away. So that's the kind of thing that fishing can do for you. ITV News is sad to report that three members of our staff working in Iraq are missing. The whereabouts of Terry Lloyd and his colleagues Fred Nirak and Hussein Othman are unknown, but ITN and the ITV network say every effort is being made to find them. Uh, Terry Lloyd from ITN was an independent uh, journalist, the same as I was. He was ITN's maverick team. He was unilateral. He wasn't being looked after by the troops. He wasn't embedded. He wasn't doing what he was told. He got over the border in the same way as I did, but the day after. So for the first time in my career, I'd, if you like, beaten Terry on a sort beaten Terry to a story, um, which was a major thing for me. Terry would have been the first person to come up to me and shake my hand and say, well done, mate. Uh, but he got over the day after, um, and he basically turned right at a crossroads towards Basra, where we turned left towards Baghdad. And he drove up the road, and there was an Iraqi truck in front of him, so they, they stopped, and as they stopped, the Americans on the hillside opened up on the Iraqi truck with big weapons and blew that to pieces. And then Terry's driver, uh, cameraman was driving, tried to reverse out of the way. And then the Americans just saw this truck uh, that Terry was in, the, the, the car Terry was in, and opened up on that as well, despite the fact it said TV all over, all over it. Um, but uh, yeah, so, and he got, he was, he was killed outright. Um, so Sky, although we were rivals because I was working for Sky News, he was working for ITN. The next day uh, when we, f we found out that Terry had been killed, my boss phoned me to say, can you go to Basra and get Terry's body out of the, it's in the morgue, we think, at, at Basra. Well, the British troops hadn't actually got into Basra yet, so it was still under Iraqi control. So there was nothing we could do. So we, it was, it was really um, uh, very, very frustrating and terribly sad as well. I mean, I knew Terry's family, they're a lovely, lovely family. Um, and uh, yeah, he was a very good, very good pal. I think if you were to put things into balance uh, and go back, I wouldn't do anything different. Um, 
I loved doing what I did. I loved my job. Uh, I'm not going to deny the fact that it was fun and it was scary, but it was brilliant at the same time. And I would never change it. I would never, never do a, a, a different job. Ross Appleyard, Sky News, Iraq. Ross Appleyard, Sky News, Albania. Ross Appleyard, Sky News, Sierra Leone. Ross Appleyard, Sky News, Brisbane. Ross Appleyard, Sky News, Albania.